Uh, praise God, what a great hymn that is, what a great truth, how we need uh, the Spirit to come and to reveal uh, our God to us. Um, we thought about that Lord's Day, um, uh, the day of Pentecost. The Spirit came uh, not to testify of Himself, but to show the world Jesus. Let's uh, turn to John's Gospel, chapter 14, and to the upper room, Jesus with His disciples, uh, the night of His betrayal. And this loving conversation uh, with his disciples. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. Pray, Heavenly Father, uh, that you would speak to us. Show us, Lord God, your amazing love. Uh, show us uh, who we are uh, in, in your sight and all that you have done for us and will continue to, to do for us in and through thy Son, Jesus. We ask then these things in his precious name. Amen. Uh, let me um, point you to uh, a very little word uh, at the end of verse 18 in John 14. Uh, that word is you. Uh, and... Uh, there are many repetitions of you uh, in that passage we read in John 14. Uh, and this morning, uh, I want uh, our focus uh, to be upon you, uh, and if I may include myself in that you. Um, and, uh, you know, we ask, or sometimes we are asked, you know, is, is the Bible relevant? Well, there's a focus in the Bible on, on you. And so the Bible is relevant to you. Um, and so this morning as we look at, at you, uh, that's somewhat uh, unusual perhaps. You might ask, uh, isn't Christian worship about God? Aren't we here to learn about, about God and to worship Him and to praise Him? Uh, well, we are. And Christian worship is all about God. But we, we need to know who we believe in. And we need to know who we are worshiping. And, and Christian worship is, is about God and, and you. And how do I relate to God? What, what has God done for me? What is God doing for me? Um, and, and here in John 14, in this upper room, uh, and as Jesus heads, heads to the cross... He, he points out to his disciples that he has an interest in them and this repetition of you. And, and this morning, friends, you need to understand that God has an interest in you. And so we're going to focus on ourselves, on, on, on you, the you of John 14 and how you relate to God how God relates to you, and what God has done for you, what he does for you, that you may know God. And the emphasis and the focus on you is, is not, it's not really unusual. Um, and the Bible is full of God dealing with men and women. That's uh, part of the reason we have the Bible, is, is, is that God would speak to you that's what he's done all these years since the beginning of creation. He's a, he's a God who speaks. Uh, he, he, wa he walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the garden, and, and he's still the God who speaks with you today. And especially in John's gospel, we can say that you know, John's gospel is uniquely addressed to you. And that's, that's what John tells us. I've brought that to you many, many times in John 20, uh, verses 30 and 31. And uh, John recounts that Jesus did many other things that are not in his gospel. He's not trying to give us a biography of uh, an exhaustive biography of Jesus' life. But he says the things that are written are written that you might believe. That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that you might have life in his name. And, and it's, it's to you. So what, 
what God does for you. So before we get to what does God do for you, and what does God think of you, uh, we need to ask the question, well, who is, who is our God? Who is your God? Or who are, who are your gods? One of the great accusations against the Christian is that the real problem with Christians is that they worship three gods. Uh, that's what our opponents will tell us. Um, and they can't, they can't get their head around the fact that Christians have three gods. And Christians seem quite content about that. Um, and our opponents may well point us to John 14. Here are your three gods in John 14. Um, they're very clearly here. There's the Father in verse 16. Uh, I will pray the Father. He shall give you a, another comforter. Um, so that's one of these Christian gods, uh, as our opponents would say. Uh, and then there's uh, God the Spirit in verse 17, even the Spirit of truth. And in verse 18, there's God the Son. I, says Jesus, will not leave you comfortless. Um, well, of course, Christians don't believe in three gods uh, because the Bible declares one God. And we believe in one God who from all eternity has been and existed uh, as three persons. And the blessed Holy Trinity. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, we read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord our God is one Lord. And we believe in the Holy Trinity, in one God, three persons. And as we do that, our opponents will tell us, you know, the problem, the problem for the Christian is that the Trinity is not in the Bible. And it's an invention of man. And the Trinity is an invention of the church. Um, and, you know, they can say what they want. But the truth of the matter is the Trinity is everywhere in the Bible. Uh, and not least in John 14. And uh, we have one God. Uh, without beginning, without end, eternally three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they're here in John 14, and the Trinity is here, one God, and uh, the Trinity is everywhere throughout the Bible. Um, we need to remind ourselves uh, that there is, there's, no, there's no perfect analogy on earth to explain the Trinity. Uh, we try. Uh, and many examples I could quote to you. Sometimes we try to teach uh, our God, the Trinity, to our children uh, by use of the analogy uh, of, um, of water. Uh, so we, water is ice, uh, and water is flowing water, and if you boil up water, it becomes steam, uh, but it's, it's all uh, water. And, um, and we try and teach our children um, that's, that's the Trinity. Um, that analogy uh, does not teach the Trinity uh, at all. Um, and I don't want to get too technical, but it's important that we understand that the, what that teaches is a Christian heresy called modalism. Uh, and modalism is that God has appeared uh, in three distinct forms or modes. Um, and so with the, the ice, water, and steam, uh, that's what we're saying, that, you know, the, the, the water was once ice, then it became water flowing, and then it became steam. Uh, that's, that's, not, that's not true of God. Um, and God has always been the Father, He's always been the Son, He's always been uh, the Spirit, um, and uh, that's our God. And here in John 14, uh, there's a great question from one of the disciples. How is it that you'll display yourself, manifest yourself to us and not to the world? 
And Jesus replies, because the world don't know me and they don't love me. Uh, our God is one God, um, and he's always been three persons. Um, and the modalism is a terrible heresy. It comes in many different forms. Uh, in, in its most crude form, uh, you have God as the Father um, in the Old Testament, but he's a tyrant father, uh, and he's, he, he's really harsh and horrible, and uh, he's all about killing people. Uh, and then God comes as Jesus uh, in a different mode, uh, and, and, uh, and Jesus is nice and kind, uh, but, but now God has come as Spirit. This is the age of the Spirit. Uh, and so you can forget about the other gods. Um, so we need to be careful that we know our God. He is the blessed Trinity, one God. Truly, He is eternally three persons. So much for who our God is. In John 14, in the upper room, what does God do for you? Well, praise God, we're told here that God loves you, dear Christian. And never, never doubt that. Verse 21, uh, at, um, Jesus says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest or display myself to him. Um, shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, says Jesus. And then you have this question at verse 22, uh, which we alluded to already. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, the other Judas, Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man loves me, he will keep my words. My Father will love him. We will come unto him and make our abode with him. You'll never know anything of the love of God. You'll never know anything of a loving Heavenly Father unless you first know him and love him. And, and love him because of what he has done for you. So I remind you of John 3, verse 16, the extent of the love of God, that in this manner God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And friends, why would you not love God? <laughs> why would you why would you turn away from that sort of love? He's, he's given his son for you. And sometimes we, we need, you know, there's a great call in our, in our culture to be, to be selfish and focused on self. There, there are times when we need to spiritually just get that. You know, it's, a, it's, it's no use if Jesus Christ is the savior of everyone else in this room, but he's not your savior. It's no use if he's loved everybody else, but you don't know that he loves you. That's why there's a focus on you. My friend, you cannot let this pass by. There's a loving father, a father who from all eternity is God, and he loves you. And the cross, and Jesus Christ, God's own Son, hanging on the cross, shouts, I love you. And he calls you to come in faith, to believe and trust in him. Let me take you from John's Gospel to John's first letter, 1 John. It's towards the end of the Bible. And uh, the same John who wrote, the bio, who, who wrote uh, John's Gospel, who wrote Revelation. But he, he later writes this epistle. Uh, First John chapter 3, just here John explodes. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. 
Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. And there's a sense that John lifts that from the discussion that Jesus had with him in the upper room. Why is it you display yourself to us, you make yourself known to us, but not to the world? Because the world don't want to know me, and they don't love me. And they're prepared to disregard my love for them. First John, uh, next chapter, chapter 4, uh, verse 10. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son, that's Jesus, to be the propitiation for our sins, to be the one who takes all the wrath that's due for our sins on his own body on the tree, to turn away the wrath of God due to us and take it upon himself. That's what propitiation means. And that's love. And if you know, if you know that love, then you will love him. First John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. Friends, I hope you're not one of those people, I hope you're not one of those people who believe that if there is a God, then he's a God who's against you. You know, there are loads of people, I've met them, I'm sure you've met them, and they are convinced that God hates them, that God's against them. That the mess that their life is in is because God doesn't want them to be happy. And, and God doesn't want them to do this or that. And, and that's, that's nonsense. It's a lie of the devil. Jesus says, God loves you. And Jesus' life, his condescension to come among us, and his death says, it shouts, God loves you. I mean, what is the greatest need of the human heart? I mean, what's, what's the one thing that we, we crave? Isn't it just to be loved? You know, the, the great disaster of our, of our younger generation, so many of them, they just want to be loved. And they believe that no one loves them, and their parents don't love them, and, and they don't have any friends, and the world's against them. And, and, and you can read all the statistics about suicide and, and mental health and terrible, um, because they're told they don't have any worth. And they'll not be loved, they believe, they'll not be loved until they're perfect, and they have to do this and that to be accepted. And here's God. And the great hymn, Just As I Am Without One Plea, and, and you can come to God just as you are, and He loves you for who you are. And behold your God. And Jesus says, your God loves you. That's the first thing. Secondly, Jesus says that God comforts you and will always comfort you. That's the context here in the upper room. Verse 1, I remind you of that. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Verse 16, I will pray the Father he shall give you another comforter. He may abide with you forever. This is not some short-term counseling or something. This, this is God. And his, his, his character is to comfort and to help and to support and to guide you through life and take you through life. 
and be there to comfort you when no one else will comfort you. And, and that's repeated in verse 26. By the Comforter. Who is the Comforter? Which is the Holy Ghost? whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things, bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. This is your God. This is what he does for you. Second Corinthians chapter 1. Um, the Apostle Paul, these great statements of God the Comforter, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, we, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Isn't it a great thing to be comforted? You know how we comfort our children, we comfort our friends, we comfort those who are bereaved. You know, the value of a hug. <laughs> we might say it reverently. That's what God does. When he sends the Spirit, he comes to hug us and, and fold us in, in his arms of love. You know, social media is full of, of people sending hugs. You know, whatever problem people are going through, the great reply on the internet is sending hugs. It's a great thing. But isn't it a great thing, a greater thing to be hugged by God Almighty? He's a God. He's God of the Bible. He's the only God. And He loves you. And He comforts you. Jesus tells us further in John 14 that if you believe in him and trust in him and you turn away from your sin and you turn to Jesus, then you'll find, you'll find this, that God lives in you. And unless, unless the Bible made that plain, I don't, believe, I don't think I'd believe it. I don't think any of us would believe it. But, but God lives in the believer. And that's here in, in verse 23. Jesus answered, saith unto him, If a man love me, if a woman loves me, if a boy or a girl love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we, that's the, the Father and the Son, we will come unto him, and that's alongside him, and make our abode with him, that is, in him, in you. And that's your God. He's not a distant God. Again, that's what the world believes. That if there is a God, he's way up there in heaven and he doesn't care anything about us. And he doesn't care about the world. And he, he, he doesn't care that, that people are dying in war and children are dying and, and there's terrible disease in the world. He doesn't care because he's a God, he's a far off. But that's a lie. He's here and he's in you, God Almighty. And God the Spirit lives in you. Verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you. That's alongside you. That's a great thing, isn't it? That God is alongside us. But that's not the end. And shall be in you. Singular. All of you. In I mean, isn't that unbelievable? But it's true. That's what God has done for us. That's what Jesus has attained. And that God has come and he dwells in the believer. And let me point out to you as well that verse 23 doesn't say, and we will come and 
stay with you for a day or two, or maybe we'll hang around for a week. Jesus says elsewhere at the end of Matthew's gospel, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you to the end of the age. There will never be a day when I'm not with you. You might feel I'm not with you. You might feel uh, that I've abandoned you, but I tell you, I'll be with you all the time. That's what abode means. Make our abode, our dwelling place, our settled dwelling place with you. Um, and surely we're, we're meant to see, and we will see, something of chapter 15. As Jesus goes on, it's a different chapter, but it's the same conversation. He'll say, um, abide in me, John 15, 4, um, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of myself except abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I, I will abide. God the Father lives in you. God the Son, God the Spirit. This only God, the one God, who from all eternity has been God, from all eternity he's been God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What does he do for you? Well, friend, if you're a Christian this morning, you need to know and be reminded from the lips of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that God loves you in all your trials and sorrows and tears. God comforts you. And amazingly, God, who inhabits the universe, lives in you. God Almighty, the blessed trinity of love, loves you, dear Christian, comforts you and lives in you, and your God shall return and receive you. Uh, that's what Jesus has said um, in verse 3 of chapter 14. Uh, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Um, he's, he's in you, friend. He can be in you. If you're not a Christian this morning, you can have God in you, living in you. Um, and maybe you're a Christian this morning and you have never really grasped the enormity of what Jesus says in John 14. Um, I mean, it is staggering. Uh, you know, just um, let me just point them to you. Just at the end of verse 17. Uh, concerning the Holy Spirit of God, and he shall be in you. Um, and at the very end of verse 20, at that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. That's what Jesus says. He promises the Spirit, and the Spirit will be in you. God in you by his Spirit. But but, this, but the Spirit is God, and Jesus, the Son, is God. And so, so Jesus is in you, verse 20. But the Son and the Father are one, and I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. So at the end of verse 23, you have, we will come unto him and make our abode with him. That's where we'll be, in you. And all of this is predicated on the fact that you love him. Verse 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. How is it, Lord, that you'll not manifest yourself to the world? Because they don't love me. And he came to his own, and his own received him not. 
And he cried over Jerusalem, how often, how often, and you would not. And friend, he's come to you many a time and called you to turn from your sin and believe in him and to love him, and you would not. But why wouldn't you love him? I mean, why would why wouldn't anybody love him? This is this is God, the creator of the world, the one who has sent his son, his only son. And Jesus, who willingly came, he gave up glory, set aside glory, and came and was born of the Virgin Mary and laid in a stinking manger in Bethlehem and, and lived a life sinless life, and he lived it among men and women like us who were dreadfully sinful. And then he went to the cross for them and hung on the cross, and the wrath of God fell upon him. And all your sin that caused his death, the punishment was laid upon him in, in your stead because he loved you. And if you love him, and you will find he lives in you and will abide with you for all eternity. And friend, why wouldn't you love him? You know, I'm not ashamed. I make no apology for focusing on you this morning because that's what Jesus does. And we are here to worship God, but we need to know who God is and we need to know what he's done for us and how he loves us and comforts us and and he comes and lives in us and he's going to come back and receive us who believe and take us to be with him and wouldn't you love him god who loves god who comforts God who lives in you, God who one day will come back again. And if you're believing and trusting in him, he will receive you and take you to himself. Behold your God, your God. He's here by his spirit today and you can know him and believe in him. Turn from your sin, come unto me this great God, great Jehovah, three in one. Know him, love him, believe in him. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, how we thank you for your amazing love to us in giving your son for us. And this great news comes to us and, and, and here's this word of God speaking to me. It's, it's for you. And this great call, that if you would turn from your sin and believe and, and love me, then you would find truly how much God loves you. And you wouldn't go through this world on your own, but you'd go through the world and this life comforted by God, because God is in you by his Spirit. And you would live this life knowing that one day he God, the living God, will come again for me and receive me unto himself. Lord, we thank you for your great call and love. Help us all to love you and to believe in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. Glory be to God the Spirit, great Jehovah, three in one. Glory, glory, while eternal ages run. This is your God, the hymn 58 will stand to sing.
unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we are uh, we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us unto him be glory in the church by christ jesus throughout all ages world without end amen